Welcome. Today is June 13, 2022, and you are listening to the Caravan Podcast, a venture of the Herbert and Jane Dwight Working Group on the Middle East and the Islamic World at the Hoover Institution. The Working Group publishes research and commentary on the Middle East with questions for U.S. policy, and you can find our work at www.hoover.org slash caravan. I'm Cole Bunzel, a Hoover Fellow and member of the Working Group, and today I'm very pleased to be speaking with Nelly Lahoud, a scholar and researcher who has written extensively on Islamic political thought, jihadism, and al-Qaeda, among other topics. Nelly is a political scientist by background. She's taught at Goucher College and the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, including the Combating Terrorism Center, for which she's contributed numerous publications. And currently, she is a senior fellow at New America's International Security Program. But most important for the discussion today, Nelly is the author of a new book, which is titled The Bin Laden Papers, How the Abbottabad Raid Revealed the Truth About Al-Qaeda, Its Leaders, and His Family. And we'll be discussing the new book today. I've reviewed the book quite favorably in Foreign Policy, and you can read that if you like. Uh, I think it's a very important contribution to the literature on Al-Qaeda and bin Laden, particularly uh, for the years between 9-11 and the raid that killed bin Laden in May 2011. And it also has a lot to say. It has a lot of implications for how we ought to understand Al-Qaeda today, the way it's structured and the kind of threat that it poses. Uh, in any event, that's enough from me. Without further ado, Nelly, thank you very much for coming on the podcast and congratulations on the book. Thank you for having me, Cole. And uh, thank you also for taking the time to review the book for foreign policy. It was very thoughtful and uh, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure. I think it's uh, it's it brings a lot of clarity to a uh, what is clearly a very politicized subject. And uh, my own sense is that your work is very far from you know, the kind of politicized narratives that one reads about about Al Qaeda. Um, and so let's get right to it. Um, the book, once again, is titled The Bin Laden Papers, How the Abbottabad Raid Revealed the Truth About Al Qaeda, Its Leader and His Family. And the papers in, type, in, in the title are, of course, the documents that were recovered in the raid in Abbottabad, Pakistan, that killed bin Laden and a couple others in May 2011. And these documents are key to the story that you tell. So perhaps you, we could begin by just telling us something about these sources and how you became interested in them in the first place. Sure. So my history with the bin Laden papers goes back to 2012, when the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the ODNI, declassified the first batch of documents through the Combating Terrorism Center, the CTC at West Point, where I was working at the time. Um, I led the, the study that accompanied the release of these documents. And though we only had 17 files at the time, no more than 170 pages, um, it was still revealing uh, the information that the letters uh, uh, revealed. And the same office, the ODNI, subsequently declassified several batches um, of files directly on its own website. We know it by the Bin Laden bookshelf. But most importantly, in November 2017, the CIA declassified everything that's going to be declassified from the raid. And we're talking here about a massive volume of documents, thousands of files. Um, now, whereas the ODNI had categorized all these documents in terms of which were the internal communications, um, what was secondary sources, what they were reading, meaning information available in the open source. The CIA declassified everything. Um, we, you have thousands of files of um, text, audio, and video files. Now, I clicked most likely on thousands of files, and I determined that it was the text files that would be most important and where I would find um, Al-Qaeda's internal communications. So with the help of two research assistants, we went through all the text files, um, about not nearly 97,000 files. And as I had suspected, um, Al-Qaeda's internal communications were amongst these files. Now, to be clear, most of them turned out to be publicly available information, such as newspaper articles, secondary sources, but about 6,000 Arabic pages um, were internal communications. These were Al-Qaeda's closely guarded secrets. And uh, I don't need to 
uh, uh, to stress this, but you know, I've been working on Al Qaeda for years. Al Qaeda dominated world politics for over a decade. So to be able to have access to the group's internal communications was something you need. And it was an opportunity to, to write a book about it. Hence the Bin Laden papers. Bin Laden papers, or, or we could say the Abbottabad papers. Um, Correct. But, sure. Right. So one of the things that, that jumped out to me, and I, I did not know this, was um, how exactly some of these text files were um, communicated from Bin Laden, from the Abbottabad compound to his subordinates in, in Waziristan and Iran and other places. And you say that they, at least in most cases, they seem to have been sent um, using what do we say, um, the, the SIM cards on cell phones. Right. Uh, how did you figure that out? Well, uh, to be clear, these, this information is not really discussed in the letters um, for security reasons. They maintained um, uh, uh, security measures that they wouldn't discuss such matters. Fortunately for us, uh, at some point in... 2010, Bin Laden writes a letter to his top associate in North Waziristan, suggesting that perhaps to speed up his uh, uh, public statements, he should perhaps you know, send them directly to the media arm uh, that is sympathetic to Al-Qaeda as Sahab. And so out of 6,000 Arabic pages, we only have this information on one, because his top associate was very concerned about this. He wrote back to bin Laden and said, you know, I thought long and hard about this, and absolutely not. You should not do that, because that would compromise our security measures here. And then he proceeded to tell bin Laden how the information is being transmitted. I and see. so we learn from these letters, um, as you said, that, that the information... Um, that the letters were saved in the Bin Laden household, um, and then they were being placed on the Arabic word is shara'ah, so I'm assuming it's a SIM card, that gets placed in an envelope, and this envelope, upon reaching its destination, only one person in North Waziristan gets to remove these SIM cards and then send all other letters onward to their other destinations if it's not for him. Now, these, these, um, the, the transfer of the letters um, from Abu Taba to North Waziristan was part of a very complex operation. Um, and we know that, again, from the letters, that the communications occurred through a closed circle, to quote from the letters, consisting of two intermediaries and one courier in between. There was one intermediary on the part of North Waziristan and another intermediary on the part of on the side of Bin Laden um, and a courier in between. Now, what is revealing about, about this is that Bin Laden never met any of the intermediaries. Um, he didn't know the identity of the courier, let alone meet him. And even more impressive, uh, more impressive is that the courier himself didn't actually know what he was carrying, let alone wow. their intended destination. So what happened is that in Abu Tabad, there were two security guards living in the um, compound uh, adjacent to, to the Bin Laden uh, household. These two security guards, there were two brothers, Abu Ahmad al-Kuwaiti and his brother. They were both Pakistanis living with their respective families next door. And... Um, it, it, most likely, one or both brothers would um, played a minor role in uh, taking the outgoing, uh, uh, the outgoing communications. They would have met with an intermediary, possibly in Peshawar, where they exchanged the letters, mm -hmm. the outgoing and incoming letters. And so it's a, it's a very, very complicated process. And this, and thanks to this letter that I mentioned earlier, we get to know. Um, about this, how this clandestine trio operated. That's quite a, a way to live for, for, 
I think he was there from 2004 to 2011, something like that, 2005. The letters do not actually mention. I mean, you, you wouldn't, you're not going to know from the letters when he actually moved or where he was living. These are, mm -hmm. you know, strictly these, these measures wouldn't, wouldn't be raised in, in the compound. But according to the CIA, he moved to the compound in 2005. Mm -hmm. I can't, you know, from my perspective, this is not something that I can, that I have any information um, on. What I would say is that he managed to reconnect with um, uh, his wife, Siham, their two daughters, and their son in late 2004. And because he had a child with his youngest um, wife, so he must have reconnected with her um, some, sometimes in 2002. But in terms of their movement to Abu Dhabad, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to say, judging by the letters, mm -hmm. when they moved there. Yeah, just one thing to emphasize, I think, um, to get the picture in people's head, Bin Laden and his his family who are there with him, they don't have access to, to internet, they don't have access to phone, their entire um, access to the outside world comes through this courier network and these text files and perhaps whatever else is coming into the compound in terms of uh, news clippings and videos uh, via the couriers. Um, and that's, Correct. yeah, yeah, Absolutely. that's really a... Uh, quite a way to live um, for, for the leader of Al-Qaeda. Um, there's one other thing before we, we move on to, to Al-Qaeda and what the documents reveal that I want, just want to ask, because I know somebody mentioned in perhaps, I think one of the reviews, um, the possibility that some of these letters could have been distorted somehow, or that perhaps um, Al-Qaeda was trying to mislead future researchers or something like that. What do you, what do you make of, of this idea? Well, actually, it, it's a good point. It's a good question mm -hmm. to ask, but... It's actually astonishing that we do have these letters. Um, the reason I say this is because about a month before the raid, um, Bin Laden's top associate wrote Bin Laden uh, a 12-page letter, and at the end of that letter, he um, included a, a remark, a PS. Um, I've destroyed all the SIM cards on which we've been saving our correspondence. I, you know, This is a gentle reminder that you do the same as we periodically do. So clearly the protocol was to destroy these letters um, or to destroy these SIM cards and not to have any, not to have them bound. So, so it's, it's remarkable that we have them. Now, in terms of where they, they're distorting, they were not distorting the information. But in some instances, we find that sensitive materials, um, particularly whether it's names of people, um, the number of fighters and so on, they would not be included in the same letter. Instead, you would find an attachment, um, a separate attachment of the names of people or the, you know, and sometimes the attachments are not recovered and we would have missing information. So they did not really distort, I mean, because they don't have any other means. It's not as if they could distort a letter and then pick up the phone to clarify. As you said, okay. as you rightly pointed out, there are no telephones and no emails, no internet. So um, occasionally they would they would write, they would uh, be a little bit cryptic on the basis that the person receiving the letters would be able to understand what is being discussed. Um, but it's not in terms of, uh, I wouldn't say that they were distorting uh, um, any any of their communications. It seems like if anything, they they failed to to delete a lot of the the information that they probably should have. Um, well, it's interesting you say that because because it's not very clear to me um, whether Bin Laden actually delete, deleted them and thought that they were actually deleted because um, I, I did not benefit from the CIA from any conversations with the CIA. And I am certain that the CIA was able to recover deleted materials, some of which were not actually, did not belong to the Bin Ladens. So did Bin Laden actually delete them and the CIA manage to recover from deleted information? It's a, it's a question mark. So I, I, hope, I hope to know the answer to this question at some point, but perhaps I may not, not know it. All right, so let's move on to some of the uh, the findings of of the book and and how how the Abbottabad records or documents how they how they've shaped your your views on Al Qaeda because you've been writing about Al Qaeda for for a number of years. These aren't the first um, 
kind of documents or exposés that you've had access to. But so how did these documents kind of shape uh, your own views of Al-Qaeda or, or change some of the views that you, you previously had, or perhaps even reinforce views that you already had? Well, the, the letters are brimming with revelations. And in the process of um, reading and analyzing the letters, I've had to revisit some of my own um, some of my own assumptions and many of the assumptions of others. Now, to be clear, my work on Al-Qaeda had mostly focused on ideological text prior to that. Occasionally, uh, on, on some occasions, I've also um, written on the basis of capture battlefield documents. Some things I got right before, some things I didn't. And I had to revisit some of my own assumptions in, in the process. Um, but to be clear here, um, and, and allow me to say a little bit more about, about sure. the letters, um, it's one thing reading the letters. It's another to actually process the, the letters and make sense of what was happening. Um, it took me a long time to be able to appreciate and to process the materials. And I was only, it was probably midway through my book, research on the book, that I was able to say I am confident that I know um, that I'm starting to process the materials. And I was able only to do that once I established the chronology. Um, because the, you know, the, the letters, you, you, you don't know what's going on. Uh, um, and, you know, it's not as if they, they lay out for us the history of Al-Qaeda and the chronology. And they're not all dated, as I've seen. That's right. They're not all dated. And uh, and sometimes when, when you get these letters that are not dated, you have to search for clues in the content of the letter and try to approximate at what point these these letters were uh, um, were were written. And, and it's only really once you process the chronology of these letters that you could start to be in a position where you understand what is happening. Just to give you an example, one of the letters... One of the 2004 letters by Osama bin Laden, I found, you know, he was he was writing about uh, the terrorist attacks in Mombasa in November 2002. So, you know, for a while I was so surprised. Why did it take him so long to to be writing about about such an attack? Why why wait until 2004? But then the longer I immersed myself in in the letters and reading the letters, um, I discovered that all the 2004 letters, for instance. Um, were briefing bin Laden about events that occurred much earlier. They were briefing him in some letters about the during the past three years, during your disappearance, and so on. So that really clearly established for me that though bin Laden uh, uh, had been releasing public statements between 2002 and 2004, he had not been in contact with his uh, um, with his associates. It's only, and we don't know why it was in 2004 that he resumed contact. So it, it made me feel more comfortable about the things that I was confident about. And I felt also in a position to say, well, other things I don't know about. And I'm just going to, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, but I became more comfortable about the things that I didn't know about either. So, as you said, in, in 2004, that's when bin Laden kind of reestablishes contact with his associates. We don't really know where he is at the time, but um, you have this chapter or chapters devoted to explaining how he tries to kind of reestablish control and also reestablish uh, the direction of Al-Qaeda as, a, as the, the preeminent terrorist organization that's focused on attacking uh, the West. But you, you come to the conclusion that, that Al-Qaeda's strength was not what a lot of it, a lot of um, analysts and the media kind of made it out to be. That it was, as you say, and I think you're quoting from one of bin Laden's subordinates, it was an afflicted, quote unquote, organization. Um, one, of the, one of these associates, a certain Tawfiq, writes to bin Laden in 2004, and I'm quoting from your book, quote, our afflictions and troubles following the fall of the Islamic Emirate, that's the Taliban, were heartrending. The weakness, failure, and aimlessness that befell us were harrowing. 
Um, and there are a few times in the book where I, I note that you're kind of mocking the quote, mighty Al Qaeda, the quote, Leviathan, the quote, behemoth shadows that it cast in the corridors of power in Washington. So um, you, you kind of end up with this view or, um, of Al Qaeda as a, a diminutive uh, organization and not really the this uh, terrifying threat that a lot of us had in our minds. So can you talk a little bit about that and the the strength of Al Qaeda that you come to the conclusion of? Sure. So, to to my surprise, when when you know Bin Laden reconnects, he's as as you uh, as you rightly pointed out, Al Qaeda had, was was shattered by two thousand four. To be clear, the only attack that Al Qaeda was able to carry out after nine eleven was the Mombasa attack in November two thousand and two, um, and the reason why Al Qaeda operatives were able to pull it off is just because the operatives who had been designated to go and plan uh, those attacks had left Afghanistan uh, uh, before 9 11. So they were in East Africa before Al Qaeda was, was shattered. Um, just to refresh our minds, the Mombasa Kenya attack, and that's, you know, just that's right. describe These it a little. Two, two simultaneous attacks. Um, one uh, attacked the Paradise Hotel, um, uh, uh, and the other one, it, it attempted to hit one of the Israeli um, jetliners, and it's, it, it, didn't, uh, it, it wasn't successful. Uh, so these were two simultaneous attacks. One of the reasons the, the reason I found out I, I was able to, to connect the dots is uh, I had done a study um, about Fadel Harun, the lead operative of the 1998 East Africa bombings, and was also tasked with one of these these uh, uh, these attacks. And it's really in his autobiography where I learned about the code names that that uh, that, that they were used. And Bin Laden was using the same pen names of these operatives. So I was able to put the two and two together, and I knew why we could really say that the no- November 2002 attacks were had been. Uh, had been orchestrated by by Al Qaeda, so um, it, so we find that Al Qaeda, following Operation Enduring Freedom, was shattered. That Bin Laden had to disappear out of the, out of necessity, and I'm quoting these letters at the moment. Um, it, it, by you know, and it's not just in 2004. Subsequent letters, all the way up to 2011. We find bin Laden concerned about the fact that al-Qaeda was not being operational. We find that his associates are having to tell him that um, we simply uh, uh, cannot move. We don't have the resources. They were low on funds. Um, beyond beyond the, the operational enduring freedom, there was also the drones that were highly effective in in North Waziristan. And by 2010, we find bin Laden writing to his associates, indicating explicitly that Al Qaeda needed to change its strategy. Otherwise, it would come to an end. It would die as an organization. So, clearly, throughout these years, even though we don't have all the letters, but we have a significant number of, of letters, it's a massive volume of letters that we have that would allow us to. Um, to chronicle the key events of of Al-Qaeda. So nowhere in the letters did I find that Al-Qaeda was able to carry out attacks. Everything that I could hear from the letters, uh, that that we learned from the letters, are about Al-Qaeda's weaknesses and, 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 and its inability to be operational. The drones were so effective that we're not just talking about Al Qaeda being unable to carry out attacks. But we're also um, discovered that they couldn't even do the mundane, uh, the mundane uh, uh, task of say, you know, one letter. The, the brother, um, you know, shouldn't be driving his car to the garage to the mechanic. So even even driving the car to the garage was a big risk for Al Qaeda in uh, in North Kyrgyzstan. So it, it clearly Al Qaeda was shattered, and and that's that's something that comes that becomes. Very vivid um, throughout the mm-hmm. So Perhaps to play devil's advocate a bit, it seems that while Al Qaeda, you know, 
it comes across as shattered. It's also being shattered by Western, that is mainly U.S. Uh, counterterrorism pressure via drones. And I mean, do you think that the picture would have looked different if the U.S. hadn't uh, invested all these resources in attacking Al Qaeda? And um, you know, I think I, I I know my limitations here, and I think perhaps military practitioners would be in a better position to speak about this. Now, clearly. Um, it was a relentless campaign against Al-Qaeda. Um, were all the resources necessary, somebody else in the, you know, uh, uh, somebody else would be able to to address this question more thoughtfully than me. Having, having said that, I did, as I was as I was uh, in the course of writing the book, at one point I did have a conversation with General Votel, um, who was who was. Um, CENTCOM commander, and I did mention to him, I said, would it surprise you to learn that the last attack that Al-Qaeda carried out was the 2002 Mombasa bombing? And he said, yes, that would surprise me. Um, and, uh, and, and and he did go on to say that perhaps we overestimated our foes. Um, but but really, this is something that, that others are better placed to, yeah. uh, to address than me. I think one of the problems in, in kind of the, the analytical community that was devoted to studying j- jihadism or terrorism in the aftermath of 9-11 was that there tended to be a conflation of the terrorist attacks and of the general, the larger jihadi movement and Al-Qaeda as a, as a centralized organization. So you end up with the, the Madrid bombings and the London bombings uh, being kind of attributed to Al-Qaeda, even though the links were at, at best you know marginal. Um, and so it is, it's very revealing that, you know, we have it confirmed here that Al Qaeda as a centralized organization led by bin Laden, uh, was not involved in those attacks. And, um, I think that's something that you, you bring up, uh, quite well. I want to get to another issue, which is the, the affiliates of Al Qaeda. Of course, um, at the time of 9-11, 2001, Al Qaeda did not have affiliate organizations. It was simply Al Qaeda. Uh, so there was no reason there's no reason to distinguish between the so-called Al Qaeda Central and its branches, um, but beginning in 2003, we have these um, prol- proliferation of, of branches, regional branches of Al Qaeda, in in Yemen and then in Iraq and then in, in North Africa and in other places. Um, so, somewhat paradoxically, even though Al Qaeda is, as you say, shattered as a as an organization, the brand is not shattered, and groups want to um, they want to be part of that brand. So. Why do you think that is? What's there, so there was a mismatch in perceptions, it seems. Is that right? Well, I, I think it was Al Qaeda's biggest secret that it was chattered. And thanks uh-huh. to to the uh, to the documents um, we now have, we can really tell that it was a, a group that was that was uh, shattered. Now, um, it's very difficult to speak um, with with a great deal of confidence about the affiliates simply because um, we have their letters, but as you can appreciate, they are putting on a show to Al-Qaeda. So though I feel much more confident speaking of Al-Qaeda's inner dynamics, what the group was doing, what it was, most importantly, what, what it was not doing, it's very difficult to say the same thing about these other jihadi groups. Clearly, they all had their agendas, and because Al-Qaeda as a brand was being, you know, this is this is the group that attacked the United States, the soil, the U.S. U.S. soil. So clearly, this was something that is uh, uh, that they that they were very impressed with. They gained a lot of media attention by being affiliated with Al Qaeda, and uh, so from their perspective, an affiliation with Al Qaeda would serve them well. They would gain with with more media attention. They would ga- gain more recruitment, more jihadis reaching them, uh, perhaps even more funding, and so on. We can see from their letters that they each had, each of the groups had their agenda. Now, Al-Qaeda had its own agenda, and and it was a naive agenda, if you like. Um, practically speaking, um, it was a lifeline for Al-Qaeda. Having these, these groups acting in Al-Qaeda's name, it was a lifeline for Al Qaeda at a time when it could not do anything itself, when it could not mount any international operations. But at the same time, Al Qaeda's objective has always been 
um, to deliver a decisive blow against the United States so that the United States would withdraw its military forces from Muslim majority states. Now, bin Laden was convinced that if the US were to withdraw its forces from Muslim majority states, um, the jihadis would be able to fight these autocratic regimes on a level playing field. He thought that this 9-11 would deliver that, and it didn't. Um, but when, when some of these affiliates began to approach Al-Qaeda and wanting to be part of that brand, he thought, uh, firstly, he thought well of Muslims, of his, of his Muslim uh, jihadi brothers, and he thought that ultimately with mergers with Al-Qaeda um, becoming uh, uh, you know, more frequent, that the general Muslim public is going to rejoice by these, uh, by these mergers, and they're going to want to join the jihadis and want to support the jihadi project. He miscalculated. Um, because those affiliates ended up having different agendas from those that, that bin Laden had, and they began to engage in um, local fighting against, against their own regimes. Now, some of these mergers were successful in terms of, or had some, some positive impact on al-Qaeda, others were liabilities. So much so that by 2010, we find bin Laden uh, uh, writing to his associates, speaking about the fact that the indiscriminate attacks of, of those groups have become a liability to Al-Qaeda, that the Muslim public was repulsed by these attacks. And he began to even ins be inspired by what we thought was a reality, which was Al-Qaeda Central. Now, Al-Qaeda Central was an expression, he said, that is being that, uh, that is being used in the media. He thought, what a great idea. Let's do that. <laughs> and, uh, and he wanted his top associate to draft a memorandum of understanding, asking each one of these affiliates to um, agree not to act without Al-Qaeda's uh, uh, permission, not to release any public statements without Al-Qaeda's permission. What he really effectively wanted is to monopolize global jihad in the hands of Al-Qaeda, and that all the other affiliates would he would he would tame them, and they would play a supportive role um, uh, in in helping Al Qaeda operatives to be able to carry out attacks. Sometimes even using funds. So clearly, the investment in the um, the affiliates was a double edged sword from Al Qaeda's perspective. It seems that somewhat delusional for him to think that he was going to micromanage the affairs of all, you know, the affiliates in Yemen and Iraq and elsewhere uh, through the courier network on, on SIM cards. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, in fairness to bin Laden, he didn't want to micromanage. Um, he thought that, uh, that they would, that because he thought well of his brothers, um, he thought that they would really rise up to the challenge, that somehow they would all be on the same page. Now, and he also understood that you know they were going to be leading from a distance, um, but he didn't appreciate um, the kind of uh, uh, the, what was what was what these what these groups are going to do, and the fact that they would really depart from the mission that he had set out for himself. All right. Always to be fair to Bin Laden. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, this way we could now, name him even better later. So. Now, I mean, there, there, are some of the the details that you bring out of his communications with with the different affiliates, uh, they speak to a an incredibly high level of dysfunction and, and misalignment of you know, ideological and strategic objectives. That is, uh, it's really astounding. Um, one thing you you mention or that you show is that with the the group in Iraq, which by 2006 had been renamed from Al Qaeda in Iraq to the Islamic State of Iraq, there was simply no communication after I think 2007 or 2008. Um, so we, yeah, we could have easily seen uh, foreseen that this was not an Al Qaeda affiliate, uh, and that the group in Iraq was more than prepared to go its in its own direction, as it of course did with the the launching of of, of ISIS. Um, and there's a lovely uh, a lovely story about, um, I think, the, the North Africa branch of Al-Qaeda um, having kidnapped, uh, was it a French official and or 
and you could tell the story better. Uh, uh, no, it was it was when they when they kidnapped several uh, uh, French uh, 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 people, and and Bin Laden ended up wanting. You know, initially he wanted the woman to be to be um, a release immediately, and and his own in his own thinking, you really needed to 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 uh, to treat those hostages very well, so that. They would end up doing a PR campaign against their governments when they, upon upon release, he expected that the woman would do that. But then, you know, there, w- there was a lot going on in terms of negotiations between this North African group and the French government at the time. Now, according to the letters, the French government had actually agreed to some of the demands of that group. And then all of a sudden, Bin Laden decides to release a public statement on his own without consulting with them. Um, calling on the French government to withdraw from Afghanistan. Otherwise, we're going to shed the blood of those hostages. Now, the leaders of the North African group learned about this from the news. You know, the French had, according to their letters, they had agreed. And we're almost done, they thought. And and uh, and so, and this is, and, and to be clear, um, the North African group was the most successful merger with al-Qaeda simply because its leaders were pragmatic. They felt that they were, you know, Bin Laden felt that they were in sync in terms of their political aspirations and so on. And so even with with this group where we find Bin Laden and, and the leaders of this group to be on the same page, they simply could not be able to communicate in a timely fashion um, to coordinate things better. And of course, that that kind of foreshadows some of the the problems that you would see in in Syria, uh, beginning in 2015, 2016, with Jabhat al-Nusra, which was the Syrian branch of Al Qaeda, um, and that would eventually leave Al Qaeda in part out of frustration with the the failure of the of the ability to communicate with the top echelons of Al Qaeda in a timely fashion. Um, well, the Abu Dhabi raid was a good career move for Bin Laden. You can say that because he didn't have to suffer um, having to deal with that situation. <laughs> yeah, well, that's just to show that some of the the themes here that we're talking about, particularly when it comes to the affiliates, uh, they still resonate. And, and we find, and we find, uh, you know, I still find when I read Al Qaeda uh, materials from the Al Qaeda Central that they just don't really seem to to align properly with what's going on in the the different affiliates uh, you still find uh, this 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 emphasis on exclusively focusing on the United States as the great enemy the enemy that we should be devoting all of and they say this all of our resources to attacking and yet the affiliates which are supposedly subordinate to al-qaeda's general directives and commands they're not devoting you know any more than one percent in most of their resources to that. So um, that this stuff just uh, it strikes me as uh, as as fascinating, and it never ends. Which is which is why I mean it was very important that we recognize when we're looking at these various jihadi groups that they are, um, though they may all, um, you know, sing the praises or or they're all operating under the umbrella of jihad. We are dealing with separate entities. With different agendas, um, and 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 it was crucial to appreciate the differences as much as as much as the similarities between these groups. Yeah, and I think that has implications for how to fight them too. Absolutely. You, I mean, you have to, especially if, if one organization their agenda is entirely local. Um, maybe we should be going after the ones with the foreign objective more. Um, something like that. Uh, let's get to another topic. You're, you're not, um, you certainly don't avoid any of the, uh, the big uh, polarizing topics when it comes to, to jihadism. Uh, so I want to ask you about Iran, which is something that you do devote a lot of attention to in this book. Uh, there are, of course, um, those who have uh, claimed or, or they have accused Iran of being uh, collaborators with Al Qaeda, it's well known. I mean, there is something, of course, to to this argument. Uh, Al Qaeda has had uh, a longstanding presence, even if it's uh, you know a presence that it doesn't want to have uh, in Iran uh, since shortly after 9/11. Um, so, for some people, this is understood as a kind of um, alliance of sorts uh, between the Iranians and Al Qaeda. Uh, that's not the the conclusion. 
uh, to which you come, however, uh, from reading a lot of these documents. Uh, just to quote for, uh, briefly from the book, you write, quote, the group's hostility toward Iran from the documents is palpable uh, throughout the bin Laden papers. Um, other letters refer to Iran as, quote, the postponed enemy, whereas the United States is, quote, the current enemy. Um, and there are all sorts of, of letters that you, you highlight where the Al-Qaeda members who are in Iran are referring to themselves as a bargaining chip being held by the Iranians. So could you just explain a little bit what's going on here? How should we understand the, the uh, relationship between Al-Qaeda and Iran? So let me just say a general statement. For those of us who have been studying Al-Qaeda for many years, um, we know that Al-Qaeda is not just a non-state actor. Um, it's an anti-state actor. Al-Qaeda rejects the legitimacy of the nation state in and of itself, including Muslim-majority states. So the idea, and, and, and here this is really important, because Al-Qaeda is not a proxy of a state. That's, 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 let's establish that. With respect to uh, the presence of Al-Qaeda in Iran, as, as you pointed out, the letters make it abundantly clear that Al-Qaeda, um, that Al-Qaeda's leaders and their families were actually detained in Iran. I mean, are, are we going to say that the fact that we have Al-Qaeda leaders in Guantanamo, that this is somehow establishes an alliance between the United States and Al-Qaeda? Surely not. Now, why did Al-Qaeda's leaders go to Iran? And this is something that it was very important for me to understand because though for a long time I was able to see in the letters that the hostility toward Iran was, was palpable, I didn't really work out why they would go there in the first place. And it, it's after immersing myself in the, leader, in, in the letters for a very long time, it became really clear to me what happened earlier on in Al-Qaeda because Iran was not Al-Qaeda's destination choice. What they did initially, they went to Pakistan after, um, and let me let me say, let me go back a little bit in time. Um, mm -hmm. December, around December 6th, the Taliban regime collapsed. And it became very clear to Mullah Omar that the air campaign was targeting Arabs and their families. It was, from the letters, it was an indiscriminate campaign against, against civilians as well as fighters. And so Mullah Omar... Um, gives an order asking all the Arabs to evacuate from Afghanistan completely. Their first well, Omar, point, the, the leader, the the leader of the Taliban, to... correct. Um, so the Al-Qaeda's leadership, their first choice was to go, some of them headed to Pakistan. And here we find from the letters that um, the Pakistani authorities launched a campaign of arrest and they arrested, according to the letters, some 600 brothers, many of them died and so on. So they had no other choice but to cross illegally into Iran. So amongst those who crossed illegally were Al-Qaeda's top leaders, including um, uh, uh, bin Laden's uh, second wife, Khairiya, their son Hamza, and six of his children by his first wife, Najwa. Um, they were all headed to Iran. Now, they managed to make it to Iran because, and I'm refer, I'm using the what, what is used in the letters, Baluch brothers, um, these were Sunni militants uh, operating against the Iranian regime, were able to assist Al-Qaeda uh, by forging IDs, renting places, and so on. And for almost a year, Al-Qaeda was able to evade the authorities. They hardly used the internet. They didn't use telephones, and so on. And then the Iranian authorities, um, you know, they couldn't. They weren't, they weren't able to police their porous borders. They ended up, they, they sensed what was going on, and they ended up tracking the Baluch brothers. And this is how they managed to track down Al-Qaeda. And when they did, they detained them. Now, we know from the letters um, that, and, and, and we know really a blow-by-blow -blow description of what happened thanks to one of bin Laden's sons, Saad, who escaped from detention in Iran in 2008 and managed to make it to North Waziristan. And upon reaching North Waziristan, he writes his father this 15-page letter telling him about the miserable conditions that they were enduring in detention, um, you know, including the fact that uh, they, were not, they were not given proper medical attention. Uh, children were, uh, uh, um, were, not, were not, you know, being allowed to receive any education. Now, 
it was not an ordinary prison. Initially, they put the men in prison and the men went on hunger strike. Um, the women were sort of under house arrest. And in order, you know, for the Iranians to keep them quiet, they ended up giving them some upgrades, if you like. And these were the detention centers that allowed some of Al Qaeda members to marry. But we know from the letters and to have children. Uh, we know from the letters that that uh, that the conditions were so miserable, and that's why Bin Laden's son had to had to escape. Some of the women were suffering from psychological problems, skin problems. Um, we know from Bin Laden's letters the hostility that he had not just after two thousand one, but his hostility against Iran goes back to at least nineteen eighty seven when he was. He, he writes in one of the letters that at that time he was presenting lectures in Saudi Arabia, warning against the Iranian regime and, and so on. So there is nothing in the letters that hints in any way, mm -hmm. shape or form, that there was any collaboration between Al-Qaeda and Iran. Uh, that's fascinating. And uh, you, you write at one point about a, a prisoner uh, that Al-Qaeda took. Uh, I can't remember exactly when this was a, I think a Pakistan, no, you, you tell me. That was, that was actually in late 2008. And th thanks to the North, uh, uh, to the North African, um, to the North African group who actually mastered the craft or the art of taking hostages, Al-Qaeda learned a thing or two from, from this group. And they managed to capture an, Af uh, uh, an Iranian um, diplomat. And, and it's this, this actually was, was one of the reasons why Iran released them. Now, to be clear, I did not benefit from, uh, from any, uh, any help from the Iranian regime to help me decipher what happened. But judging by the letters, the Iranian diplomat was, was important. Secondly, the prisoners, the, the detainees in Iran, at least rioted against the prison authorities twice. Um, mm -hmm. There was a lot of blood involved in this sentence. But the crucial point, the reason why things became public and Iran had to acknowledge finally Al-Qaeda is because bin Laden's daughter, Iman, um, ended up uh, 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 escaping detention herself. He goes um, to a Saudi consulate. Right? Absolutely. Right. Once she got to the, to, the, to the Saudi consulate, you know, it became public that Iran was holding the detainees. Now, for a long time, al Iran didn't acknowledge that they had Al-Qaeda detainees. And for a very long time, because they felt, Bin Laden felt that Iran was holding the detainees as a bargaining chip, they were willing to stay quiet about this. This really caused Al-Qaeda's leaders considerable, uh, um, a, a considerable distress because they were being accused in public that they are somehow on the side of Al-Qaeda. And one of the letters... You know, we find one of our Qaeda top leaders consulting with a with a cleric, saying, "You know, how bad is this?" And he says, "You shouldn't even dignify it with a response." I mean, do you, you know, if if people said that Sheikh Osama is is uh, is an alliance with the Americans, should we respond? Of course, you know, it's like saying that that we are in uh, we have an alliance with America with America. You know, this is the same thing with Iran. We shouldn't even respond to that. So clearly, there is. Nowhere in the letters do we find a hint um, that there was any any uh, uh, collaboration or any any affinity between Iran and and Al Qaeda. Interesting. And uh, so, by two thousand ten, I think it looks like most of the Al Qaeda members and their family members who were detained in Iran are, are let out. Is that right? By, you know, so, right there? so most of them, um, it, it, was, it would have been August 2010, but there were remain some other top leaders in Iran. And it's actually from your work, uh, Cole, that I, that I learned a little bit more about what happened to, um, uh, to say Filadl and others because of because of an article that you wrote uh, to Foreign Affairs about some of these communications between or the airing of grievances between Al Qaeda and uh, Harak al Tahir al Sham. So so you you complete my story at the end. Yeah, well, that's that's why I, I mentioned this not to um, to uh, showcase my own work, but uh, just to bring up that this story also uh, this issue resonates not only. Um, I mean, from 
the issue continues to resonate because there are still certain Al Qaeda Al Qaeda leaders, senior operatives in Iran. Um, but from what I've read from internal Al Qaeda discussions that were subsequently aired online, is that these these uh, people don't want to be there, um, and that they're pretty upset that they are there. And when they had the opportunity in 2015, after another uh, prisoner exchange, when a I think the the Yemeni affiliated Al Qaeda had had uh, captured a, an Iranian diplomat. Um, after the prisoner exchange then was brokered, uh, a number of Al-Qaeda operatives were allowed to leave and they left for Syria, uh, where most of them were subsequently killed in US drones. So uh, I guess in, in, in a sense that the Iranians were doing them a favor by keeping them in prison it, uh, so that well, they couldn't be killed. Well, you could say the same thing about Guantanamo as well. I mean, <laughs> sure. otherwise yeah, they would right. have gone in North Syria, <laughs> they would have gone through the drones. But to be but clear, the, I yeah. mean, some of these issues, you know, when people talk about Iran and Al Qaeda, they show you this video of um, Bin Laden's son Hamza getting married. Well, yes, they were all living in detention; they were able to to get married. But it's not as if Qasem Soleimani was attending the wedding, or you know, it's uh, you know, it 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 there there is there is no basis whatsoever um, to thinking that somehow there was any affinity, as I said earlier, between between yeah. the two. I think another point I would make is that um, given how much we know that Iran specializes in proxy warfare, how effective it is at arming and deploying proxies, you would expect that if it was using Al-Qaeda as a proxy, it would be a little bit more effective than having uh, its last attack being the Mombasa 2002 attack. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, but with that, let's, let's move on uh, to another issue um, which continues to have relevance, and that is the Taliban. Um, so... What struck me about the Taliban, well, there are a number of different things. And um, you write in one of the early chapters about your 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 theory um, or your speculation that the, lead, the original leader of the Taliban, Mullah Omar, perhaps uh, had uh, given the green light for, Al, for, for 9-11. The, we don't seem to have a smoking gun for this, I think you would acknowledge. Um, but there isn't. Uh, but there are clues that would lead one to to believe that that Mullah Omar, uh, uh, given his his affinity for for Bin Laden and his reluctance to turn him over to any kind of international authority, that he had been in, it, probably informed of nine eleven. Um, do you want to elaborate on that? Sure. Uh, I'm I'm fairly you know my my hunch is 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 very strong on this, and the reason I say this is. You know, Bin Laden comes across throughout the letters as somebody who is highly consultative. So all the information that we've read about that somehow he makes unilateral decisions, doesn't consult, he wouldn't listen to anybody, that is completely nonsense. Um, Bin Laden was highly consultative, and we know from, from his own handwritten notes that he sat down and composed in late 2002, um, that um, in September 2002, that all the operations that Al-Qaeda was involved in uh, were actually being discussed beforehand, before the attacks. Now, Al-Qaeda didn't share the operational details with anybody. Even sometimes Bin Laden didn't know about the operational details of certain attacks simply because they wanted to maintain security measures. Um, uh, uh, now, what we seem to have, and this is something I learned about uh, not just from the Bin Laden papers, but also from other jihadi literature that was written back in 1998 about the situation between the jihadis, the Arab jihadis in Afghanistan and the Taliban. And I refer here to a book by the jihadi strategist Abu Musab al-Suri. And the reason why I consider this book to be reliable is because he was being very candid, including criticizing both Arab jihadis as well as the Afghan Taliban at the time. And we know from that book that after the 1998 East Africa bombings, there was a great deal of tension within the senior leadership of the Taliban. And many people within the senior leadership were beginning, were beginning to be very concerned about Al-Qaeda's presence, including its operations. And at some point, they all met. And for three days, they all, the Afghan Taliban met with with Mullah Omar, and when he rushed to find out what they concluded, thinking that they needed to pack their bags, he found out that Mullah Omar had chastised the senior um, Afghan, uh, uh, the senior Taliban leaders, and said to them, you know, we we were able to be victorious against the Russians. Do you think, you know, we, we need to fear 
the Americans. Um, and the other clue also is that we have letters from bin Laden consulting with Almer before 9 before 11. And subsequent letters, we find that both bin Laden as well as Azawahiri and, and others maintained their loyalty to Mullah Omar and referred to him as our um, friend, Sahabna, who, mm-hmm. um, uh, and distinguished him from other senior Taliban leaders whom they described as insincere, who, whom they described as those who are willing to compromise God's religion and specifically who are on the payroll of the um, uh, ISI, the, the Pakistani intelligence services. So we can really see from the letters that Mullah Omar stood in a very different category from the rest of the Taliban. Now, there were other, again, quote unquote, from the letters, other sincere Taliban uh, mm-hmm. leaders, but clearly Mullah Omar was uh, uh, somebody that they continued to show loyalty. And at one point in one of the letters, we find bin Laden saying that if he were to disappear, they're going to have to succeed him and make sure that you don't share your secrets with them. So it is now these these were these letters for me were shocking, um, as as many would have thought, you know, that, that this is this was a completely different relationship, much, much closer. And I was um, I was shocked when I when I read these these letters. We find that as early as 2004, Cole, um, the Al Qaeda's leaders were. Um, briefing bin Laden that the bulk of the um, Taliban had been lured by American dollars. And as early as 2004, they recommended to bin Laden that we should pack up and leave and and head to Iraq, where, according to their letters, God opened the door of jihad for us when he knew of our afflictions over here. So they didn't really feel secure, not even even in in, um, North Waziristan. so it's a yes, it's a very different it's a very different picture that we that we have of the Afghan Taliban that emerges from the letters, and we find in in 2010 we find Ayman al Sawahiri writing explicitly to Bin Laden, telling him uh, that that uh, that the Taliban are psychologically ready to enter into a deal with the United States that would render Al-Qaeda impotent. Uh, and he thanked uh, uh, the Lord that that uh, that, the, that Mullah Omar was still uh, in charge. But then, you know, the people whom they designated as insincere pal- uh, Taliban were the same people who ended up having those peace talks with mm-hmm. the Americans and concluded the peace agreement um, in February 2020. And one of those insincere, quote unquote, insincere Taliban was, I think, Mullah Akhtar Mansour, who uh, succeeded Mullah Omar as the head of the Taliban in 2013, though it wasn't revealed till 2015. We don't need to get into that. But um, it just goes to show that there there was this, uh, this you know, perhaps valid concern on the part of, of Al Qaeda that the Taliban, um, like all organizations and states uh, around the world, suffers from divisions. And... Uh, this division had a lot um, uh, to say about Al Qaeda, and um, you see today, and you've seen over the last uh, five plus years, that Al Qaeda has tried to present its relationship with the Taliban as in- entirely harmonious. Um, but we also see from the side of the Taliban, uh, pretty much radio silence when it comes to Al Qaeda. Um, and if, if anything, there's sometimes denial that there's been anyone in Al Qaeda on Afghan soil since 9/11. Um, but at the same time, uh, I have to mention that when it came to the the deal that was struck with the United States between the Taliban in February 2020 that allowed for the subsequent U.S. exit um, the following following year, uh, that the Taliban would not simply just say, "Look, uh, we 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 repudiate Al Qaeda. Uh, we have nothing to do with Al Qaeda. They're a terrible organization." They they refuse to um, to just kind of to give the Americans the one thing that they they really wanted, I think, which was the repudiation of Al Qaeda. Well, what do you think of that? Well, of course, they're not going to do that. I think these are expectations that you and I would like to would like to to hear. But what they did in that uh, uh, that they would undertake to do their best, um, their best to uh, uh, 
prevent any attacks against the United States from U.S. soil. Now, frankly, it's um, the onus is not so much on the Taliban in that agreement. Is how did the United States agree to those terms? I mean, um, it, it, it was it was surprising for me to see uh, the name of the Taliban. They didn't they didn't negotiate as if they were the Taliban. They negotiated as if they were the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. In other words, we are the government of Afghanistan, uh, meaning they excluded the Karzai, uh, not the Karzai, the um, the uh, Ghani government. Um, and though the United States said that we do not recognize them, but that same name was repeated about, I think, 16 different times in that in that four-page four document. It was... It, it was surprising to me that the United States would agree to it. Um, I, I was I was less surprised by the Taliban's terms, mm-hmm. but more surprised that, that the United States allowed. I mean, I, I think negotiating with the Taliban was the right was the right uh, course of action, um, but I I couldn't uh, I couldn't see the wisdom of keeping the Afghan government out of the negotiations, uh, allowing this to happen. And so um, I think, yeah, I, I think I think there were there were some question marks. That, there remain some question marks in my own mind about this. But when it comes to the relationship today between uh, the Taliban, or as it is better known, and according to them, the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan and uh, and Al Qaeda, uh, the, the documents lead you to believe. Um, that the relationship is is you know better, worse, the same than you had previously believed. I've been I've been reading some of the public statements that Ayman Zawahiri released, and it couldn't have been easy for him to have to watch, <laughs> even though he predicted it. But he must be really um, highly concerned about this. I mean, firstly, when Al Qaeda uh, after the withdrawal from the U.S., Al Qaeda congratulated the Afghan Ummah, not. Another Taliban, and since then he's been he's been um, kind of appealing to the Taliban to realize what was what was going on in terms of you are you know he's been he's been criticizing the Taliban for wanting to to be part of the United Nations. I mean these these are gentle criticisms, um, but certainly reveal that mm-hmm. he is uh, he, that he and and I'm sure others in Al Qaeda would be even more concerned than ever about uh, about the, the Taliban. But, but he would have been the least surprised about this. As I said earlier, he predicted it back uh, back in 2010. Yeah. I think one of the ironies is that you, you find him, uh, you quote him in a letter to bin Laden, uh, voicing his, his utter concern over this, in, this potential deal between the United States uh, and the Taliban. And, and then... Ten years later, we we see him in public praising the deal between uh, the United States and the Taliban, um, which clearly was not favorable to Al Qaeda. I, I think he he tried to camouflage it in terms of not praising the deal, but 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 he was rejoicing the fact that that the, from his perspective, it was a victory against the United States that they actually withdrew from Afghanistan. It wasn't so much the deal; it was the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Um, but he also did he did release a statement upon the deal signing. Um, calling the congratulating the Taliban for for this victory. victory. It was was the U.S. withdrawal. That was the victory. Okay, one other topic before I I let you go. Uh, You've been generous with your time. Uh, You spent a lot of um, of the book, the last part of the book, talking about bin Laden's family and what what life was like inside this this compound. Um, Maybe you could just um, tell us before... I ask you anything else about who was in the compound the day he was killed? Um, I mean, he had Bin Laden had more. You sometimes refer to his wife. He had more than one wife, uh, multiple children by multiple wives. So, 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 who was there? So, at the time of the raid in the Bin Laden household, there were sixteen people. Nine of them were children, um, and of the seven remaining adults, uh, three of his wives and two of his daughters, and um, his son, Khaled. Now, um, his, one of the wives uh, joined him in February, just uh, February 2011, just a couple of months before the raid. We're talking about Khadiya, who was detained, who had been detained in Iran, whom we mentioned earlier. 
Um, so uh, again, one of the most surprising aspects of, of these letters is that I um, came to learn that uh, most of the public statements that we've heard Bin Laden deliver over the years had been actually co-authored with uh, his his daughters, and uh, and and I'm sure his wife Siham did quite a lot of editing. But we find we we have a remarkable picture, if you like, of of life in the in, in the bin laden household what the children were doing their routine their daily schedule um we find at one point when khairia when his wife was able to join him um she would be writing back to her son hamza who was still in north Waziristan, to tell him about what life about about his his half siblings and she mentions mariam and sumaya the daughters she says you know their writings are broadcast on tv meaning that uh you know, whenever Bin Laden delivered these statements, it was it was Maryam and Sumaya's writings. We have a unique document um, that was the only, from my understanding, the only uh, hard copy that was that was recovered from the compound, and it was uh, a 220-page notebook that transcribed family conversations during the last few months of Bin Laden's life. It was a second such volume. The the first one was not was not recovered, but we find from this. Um, from this uh, notebook uh, that uh, that Bin Laden relied and counted on the input of his family. Um, the the star of that notebook is his daughter Sumaya, uh, because you know we, we find generally Bin Laden explicitly soliciting their input. That one like I said, you know, start preparing the ideas that need to go into the public statements. And uh, we find Sumaya going back and forth with her father, challenging him on issues to do with jihad. Is jihad still relevant? Um, Al-Qaeda is not in the news. This was the Arab Spring where peaceful protesters were really leading uh, the events of the, of, uh, in the Arab world. We find bin Laden being defensive at points. But particularly, um, you know, the, the, the response of bin Laden to the Arab Spring, which went... I, I was able to find at least 16 different drafts, and the names of these files are, you know, by Sumaya's input, uh, uh, Mariam's input. So clearly, uh, uh, clearly they were they were doing they were doing um, the heavy lifting. Uh, uh, you know, it's not to say that 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 uh, that Bin Laden was was absent. Clearly, he was very important, but it was one of the most uh, surprising element for me to see their input and. Uh, and the kind of the kind of resilience that they had in that compound, uh, you know, Bin Laden's, you know, his his wives and his and his children were his anchor. Otherwise, uh, I'm sure if if uh, this the life in the in the compound was was acrimonious, we would have found him much earlier than that. I'm sure the wives would have. <laughs> Would have told us about about his whereabouts, but but clearly it was a it was a harmonious uh, uh, life in the compound, and they did their best to um, to make life for the children normal in a very highly abnormal setting. And I say this: the children were not allowed to uh, play outside on their own without adult supervision because they didn't want to draw attention that the Arabs were living in the compound. Uh, so it was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a very unusual mm-hmm. and uh, distressing, I mean, uh, situation. But Bin Laden's son, uh, Khaled, contributed to recording his father's public statements. He wasn't very good at it. That's why we, we found Bin Laden's, most of his public statements were audio recorded rather than um, video recorded for a long time, if you remember, and um, but also we have this very um, strong note from Khalid, where we see how distressed he was by the living conditions in the in the compound. So good to know that uh, Al Qaeda was a family business. Uh, fortunately, not a very uh, well run or successful family business. Um, but if you want to read more about it, you'll have to, to look at the book. Uh, so with that, we'll bring us to a close. Nelly Lahoud, thank you very much for coming on the Caravan Podcast. Once again, I highly uh, recommend the book. You should check it out. It's called The Bin Laden Papers, uh, available at fine bookstores everywhere. 
please subscribe to the podcast. Uh, we'll be back soon with another episode. Thank you, Cole. It was a true pleasure. This podcast is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society and improve the human condition. For more information about our work or to listen to more of our podcasts or watch our videos, please visit hoover.org.